put off by how long this video is. Don't worry, I try to jam pack my videos with as much content and as much detail as I possibly can. Anything I feel I can comment on and that I feel you might be interested in, I pretty much put in the video. I try not to repeat myself and talk fairly fast. If the video is too long for you, I have recorded a shorter version and the link will be in the description box. Scream movie review taking place in the all-American suburban small town of Woodsboro, which is the perfect place for a slasher film to be set. The the comfortable, the the homey, the where you feel safe. This follows a small group of high school kids, most of them friends, who are stalked by a killer wielding a short hunting knife and a ghost face mask inspired by the Scream painting. Also wearing a robe, taking on the traditional image of the Grim Reaper. The, this killer is very human. He doesn't walk slowly. He's not huge or unstoppable. And he enjoys sadistically toying with his female victims, calling them when they're at home by themselves, and playing games with them before he kills them. And the, these homes are often, you know, it is a small town, but they are like on the outskirts, so they're a little bit more isolated. And the killer uses a voice modulator to call them on the phone, which means that the, the voice that they and we hear the, the killer use is the awesome Roger Jackson, yeah, the, the it's, it's absolutely perfect for the killer. And director Wes Craven, Rest in Peace, who does amazing work here, has described as, it as intelligent and evil. This is not as scary as the original Nightmare on Elm Street or New Nightmare, also done by Craven. Who could the killer be and who will be his next victim? The the killer is truly memorable, including once you do know who it is, and the, the acting of the killer is phenomenal. This is a movie that really keeps you guessing, and in, in especially in the very ending, where there's one twist after another, and it's glorious. Do not spoil this movie, not for yourself, not for anybody else. And, you know, the, the killer may be in a situation that, you know, where he isn't seen or where you wouldn't expect. And he might, you know, not attack in a situation where you might think. And there are these very intentionally ridiculous, unlikely, sometimes even impossible events and feats by the killer. And this is a slasher and a whodunit. It revitalized the horror genre, and yeah, that does mean it also led to some meh and some downright bad horror movies, including slashers. It's very tight and witty. It's fresh, clever, smart, and it's been described by the critics. I never quite... Yeah, I, I don't... I'm not a big fan of the term, but it's been described as hip. This is self-aware. It's a postmodern deconstruction of the subgenre. Breaking the fourth wall. It's it's a meta film. Some say it's too ironic and it's only, you know, it's less than half as clever clever as it thinks it is. I do understand why some people don't like it. I love it. 
it certainly is a movie that's very satisfied with itself. And some say that it's hard, even impossible, to take it seriously and thus be scared by it. Personally, I find that it balances the, the two rather well. It's a pastiche, it's full of 80s slasher trivia, and it's a loving homage to the subgenre. If you don't really love horror, this movie probably won't really do that much for you, and honestly, respectfully, it's not really made for you. This does spoil the ending of the original Friday the 13th. The rules for surviving a slasher are stated, and some of the smarter characters maybe try to, to follow them, live by them, as it were. Clichés are pointed out, and this clever, cleverly plays with conventions. And the, the very ending has this big, you know, high school, you know, kids party, where, you know, everyone lowers their guard. It's scary, suspenseful, tense, intense, creepy and disturbing. It is part parody so and, and satire, which means that some of the characters might fight back, maybe manage to slow down the the killer, and yeah, you know how in in slashers, especially, some other horror as well, but slashers especially the we the viewer are often sitting there going you know be careful he's right and you know come on grab that thing and attack him and in this they actually do and it's like oh okay then proceed and it exists in this middle ground between real life and very much a slasher reality and you know you and the characters will you know notice the shifts and yeah but you don't know when these shifts are going to be and you don't know which it's going to be at any given time i have watched all four and i love all but the third one i know nothing about the tv series the excellent script was one of the first and really made a name for kevin williamson and I consider this one of the best horror films ever made, up there with Halloween, John Carpenter's The Thing, and the original Nightmare on Elm Street. I have... and the, the very first scene of this film is pure gold from start to finish. Now, I have watched every Nightmare on Elm Street film, every Friday the 13th film, every Halloween movie, including the terrible newer ones I know what you did last summer the you know almost everything by John Carpenter not unlike the rules of attraction this you know where in that the scenes might like be really dramatic and you're like really upset by what you're seeing or you're laughing at it because it's darkly comedic in this you know you can be scared by most of it but you can also like sit back and really laugh at it because of what it does with these elements now our main lead and main strong female character is Casey, a flirtatious, sweet, easygoing girl played by Drew Barrymore. She's dating Steve, the cool, tough, you know, football player, you know, the type. And, you know, a, they're not necessarily the closest of friends, but, you know, her acquaintance, Sydney who is this really sweet, innocent, smart girl, and the, the two of them are singled out and tormented by the killer. 
and this is all happening very close to the one year anniversary of the the murder of the mother of one of them I won't give away which and you know maybe the two are connected and if if the the killer of the mother you know is still out there maybe the wrong person was convicted for it and Sydney's played by Nev Campbell she is dating Billy who is this nice you know guy but he does you know he does want them to go to the next level and he does have a little bit of a bad boy dangerous street kind of then there is the cynical sweet innocent close friend of Sid's Tatum and she is really there for Sid played by Rose McGowan which does mean she's been in at least one thing I've seen her boyfriend Stu I I love this this guy he's just really manic and and fun I can see why some will find him obnoxious he's played by Matthew Lillard and there is Randy the film nerd who knows and states the rules of slashers and he improvised funny lines and such and it is Jamie Kennedy at his most tolerable he's really the only of these actors that I particularly know from from anything else which it's only so much else I've seen. it's basically the the Jamie Kennedy experiment no I don't know why I watched that either and Gail Weathers the provocative pushy reporter who uses this killer you know and the tragedy of the mother being murdered to get a scoop you know she she did a book on the the murder of the mother which you know will be coming out and you know she's maybe hoping that if this is connected that she'll boost sales and it's played by Courtney Cox who wanted to get rid of her nice image from friends then there's the town deputy Dwight or more commonly referred to as Dewey who's this really nice you know bumbling kind of quirky type he's he's, he's cute you know you it's, it's yeah you know it's he's not the smartest not the most physically coordinated or yeah but you know he he tries to help in any way he can and he is the brother of Tatum and played by David Arquette among the 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 tropes of a slasher is of course that everyone's a suspect every character I've just mentioned and I could add there's the the principal and Gail's cameraman Kenny any one of these people more or less could be the, well you know not the not the ones attacked surely but any anyone else of these people could be the killer and these are very likable and memorable characters that we do want to survive and you know their actions and personalities make sense most of the time and you know with that said they're not necessarily all angels exactly and there is some depth and development to these characters with really solid dialogue 
and you know to an extent you could say they're they're kind of the stock slasher characters they're all well cast and I may have already stated but yeah I, I don't really know these people from anything else I mean I've probably watched I did watch both Scooby-Doo movies I have I, I don't know I, I have no idea why and uh, of course Charmed well yeah I, I don't know if you if, if you don't know exactly what you're looking at you may not be able to recognize but it is up there behind me I'm, I'm quite the fan of Charmed in case you didn't know you know I suppose and, and Nev Campbell in that one with Denise Richards, yeah, you know the one. I forget its name right now, but that's pretty much it. Now, there are some creative kills in this, but, you know, very much a state of the subgenre, but they're mostly fairly straightforward. You know, the 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 knife really does remain the the main weapon you know you've got some slit throat some gutting kind of stuff it's a very bloody and violent movie but it's not really particularly gory at least not by my definition I a, a lot of the reviews of this do say it's gory and I guess you know some dictionary definitions. I, the way I understand gore is limbs and like if you cut open somewhere, so, you know, Kill Bill, John Carpenter's The Thing, you know, gibbing in video games. That's how I would define gore, and there's almost none of that here. It's it's really mostly stabs, but. Yeah, there are a ton of those in this. And you really feel the impact when, you know, when someone is stabbed or punched or the like. You know, again, they, they will, like, punch or kick the, the killer to try to slow them down. And the, the stabbings tend to be on screen. And, yeah, there, there is some graphic violence. And I do base this on the R-rated version, not the director's cut, which I've never seen, watched. Some of the most painful, you know, most pained reactions and like... If a character seems especially terrified or the like, you know, some of those came about by accident or by by design of, you know, doing something that we don't see, but that was very effective. You know, I, I believe Peter Jackson was the one to say, pain is temporary and film is forever. I do still feel pretty bad for at least one of those pain instances. This has some really great black comedy. I really do have to comment on, I, I suppose, you know, the, the parodies of the... It's really ridiculous that there are parodies of this, given that it is part parody itself. And everything in this, every joke and bit of irony and such in this is far more effective, far funnier than pretty much anything in the parodies. Anyway, the the straight to video one, which has this really long title, you know, it's got Tiffany Amber Thiessen, if that's how you pronounce it, and you know that the guy from Roseanne, which I never watched, I just know he was on that. Anyway, yeah. It's not very good. And then you, of course, have Scary Movie. The first movie, it's not really 
particularly good, and it only got worse from there. I mean, I haven't watched one of those since the third one, but seeing trailers, you know, I, the Wayans are just not that funny. And I do say that I, I kind of like Damon Wayans, you know, his his show back in, you know, but then, you know, I have trouble respecting the man given the the human in the, the the yeah after what he fairly recently said about Cosby now this has a quite cool style it do, does some things that you know you wouldn't necessarily expect from a slasher. The score is excellent, and it's by the, at the time, you know, newly discovered, or, you know, this was pretty much where he was discovered for this, Marco Beltrami, who in general does really excellent scoring, and he decided to go against sort of conventional horror scoring and approach it like a western. So Dewey has this theme of like a quirky western sheriff with you know some some hints of Ennio Morricone in there, which is always a good place to go. And the this haunting track with somber vocals when dealing with the character whose mother, yeah, and it, it, this theme has been dubbed the voice of the franchise. This, unlike a number of classic slashers, the, the good guys actually know that the killer exists from very early on in the film, where you know, typically it's like, oh, maybe there's a rumor or an urban legend or something. Maybe there's a single character who's like, you know, who knows that the killer's out there. But most of the characters don't necessarily really believe it. And yeah, in this, they actually say, well, what if everyone did know? What if it wasn't this, you know, it, some slashers do a better job of, than, of it than others, but typically, the slasher will say, okay, the killer hasn't been discovered yet, or people don't really believe that it's real, because, you know, and maybe something looks like a suicide. Maybe the, the you know, maybe it's a character that they expected to show up, but then they died, and, you know, no one realizes that this person was killed, and they're just like, well, they're running late. I, you know, they'll be here eventually, or, you know, they go off into a deserted area, they, they go where they're isolated and they're killed, and, you know, maybe the body even hidden, and no one else really thinks much of it, because, hey, they went to that deserted... In this, from very early on, everyone knows there is a killer, and the film kind of says, you know, what what then? What? How does the town react when everybody knows that there is an actual killer? And that then, you know, does lead to some of the characters say, "This is like a slasher movie," or you know, they'll they'll yeah, it's it it leads to some really good stuff. I don't want to give too much away, and really the characters are always talking about movies, especially horror films, and, you know, especially, especially slasher films, but they do mention other ones, you know, an early one would be The Exorcist, you know, early mentioned, but I guess earlier horror movie as, as well. Anyway, yeah, so it's, it's very much, it's presenting a reality wherein the characters have watched horror movies and you know this does lead to them maybe also commenting on how 
what is happening is like a horror movie. And it's, again, I've mostly noticed it with zombie film films. Whenever a zombie situation happens, I, I have not watched The Walking Dead, so I don't know if that's, but, you know, classic zombie movies, your Romeros, you know, the characters are smart, but they're not like, I saw this in a movie once, you know, that's, that's not particularly, you know, From Dusk Till Dawn does this as well, saying this is, this is like a movie I've seen, you know, but, <sighs> I guess Romero, you know, there was zombie movies before that, and since, you know, ever, ever since the very first of the movies, not in Romero's movies, because those are all in the same universe, even the really new ones, when that doesn't really make sense, but anyway, yeah, you know, characters don't say, I've seen this in a movie, these are the things we should not let happen, you know, no matter what. If somebody's bitten, we tell the others, and we do have to, you know, it's it sucks, but we do have to, you know, kill that person so they don't infect the rest of, you know, something like that. Instead, it just happens in every single zombie movie, and the moment that you've watched more than one, you're like, why are these characters doing the stupid thing, like in the other movie, you know, and... To an extent, it's that thing of, you know, horror movie characters, they need to do the stupid things, because how else do you make sure that things can actually, you know, if, if the characters don't go off by themselves alone, then how can the killer kill them when they're alone, and things like that. And, yeah, again, when a movie like this actually goes and says, well, I've watched horror movies, literally, the the... There are characters in this who say, you shouldn't be alone, because the killer has already targeted you, so I'm not going to let you be alone. Again, very, very different from these other movies, where, you know, maybe they'll say it's annoying that I have to be alone, or, you know, my boyfriend went missing, I should probably go find him, so I'm going to go off by myself, alone, since he already walked off by himself, alone, you know, they're always acting like they have no idea that they're in a slasher movie, and yeah, it, it makes it all the more effective when they then still manage to put in scary and unpredictable stuff, and this is very much a movie that doesn't rely on jump scares, they're, you know, there are shocking little bits that, you know, make you kind of jump or the like, but they are after build-up. There's really no scare in this that happens in a scene where you wouldn't at all expect, you know, or not expect, where, you know, there's, there's build-up every single time. There's always some tension or some kind of creepy thing or maybe a character is alone in a situation where you're like, well, of course they're alone in that, yeah. And really, even very early on in this, you, you become very, very scared when a phone rings, because that is, yeah, if, if a phone rings and you answer it, it's probably the killer. And, yeah, things are going to go, you're not going to like where, where things are going from there. And there is sort of a theme in this of, like, you know, the, some of the adults are maybe like, uh, you, can't, you can't trust kids these days, you know, high schoolers and such, they're, they're all messed up. The movie is 99 minutes, not counting the end credits, and 106 if you do count them. I've reviewed other parts of this franchise, the links are in the description box. Please comment, thumbs up, and subscribe for more content.